Welcome to Healing Whole, the podcast. I'm your host, Callie. I'm a health and wellness expert, a certified personal trainer, and holistic health coach. I also happen to be extremely passionate about holistic healing. With over 13 years of experience, I've worked with clients from all walks of life. I also know a healing and holistic lifestyle can be a little overwhelming. I'm here to break it down for you and take you on my journey to healing whole. Remember, the materials and content within this podcast are intended as general information only and are not to be considered a substitute for medical advice or treatment. Hello and welcome to episode seven of Healing Whole, the podcast. I am here with Layla Fishman. She is many things, but she is, I'm very lucky to know her mostly as the owner of Boho Living, which is a soon to be online boutique where I am blessed to be her business coach. So it is in development right now. It's something that we're looking forward to launching in the near future. Um, But today we're gonna be talking about Layla's journey in healing and her experiences with addicts. So I was telling actually, I told you I'm very authentic, but I was telling Layla earlier, I usually start with how did you get in this holistic way of living, but I actually always say, how are you today? So how are you today? I am good. I'm a little uh, nervous as to what I want to say and how revealing I want to be, um, but I think the truth is always the answer. It is. The truth will set you free, right? Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. So, my second question always is, how did you get into this healing way of living? So, how did the healing journey start for you? Where did it come from? Okay. Well, Kelly, thank you so much for having me. I'm so privileged to be able to share my story. Um, it's not going to be perfect. I don't have notes, but it's going to be perfectly honest. If that's okay. I love that. That's okay. how I love it. So buckle up. Here we go. Yes, I'm excited. <laughs> All right. Um, so, hi, everybody. My name's Layla Fishman. I would think my um, theme in my life, the main theme of my life that has been there since I've been maybe like 15 has been always, there's been someone that's been addicted to something in my life. Um, So I don't know why that's been the case, but I really think that uh, we have to make our pain our passion and um, make our mess our message. I, I, I didn't really come up with those, but I like them because I'm learning the older I get, I'm learning that to pay attention, you know, with the obstacles that you've had in your life and, and learn from them and don't die with your secrets. Don't die with your story. If everybody did that, the world would not evolve. People wouldn't change. Yeah. And you wouldn't help anybody by doing that. So I'll start like when I was 15 years old, um, I dated a police officer um, that was 10 years my senior. Okay. And, um, you know, nothing against my parents or anything like that. I know everybody's thinking, oh my God, statutory rape. But back in that day, that wasn't very um, known. It wasn't, you know, it was just like, if he's a nice guy and I feel like my daughter's going to be protected, let's go with it, you know, like, and and I was kind of the black sheep and was kind of wild. Uh, I, I didn't follow the rules, put it that way. So I think that what they felt like they knew him and it was okay for me to date him. What they didn't know is that I was being abused. I was, um, you know, he took my virginity, he would confiscate drugs and make me do them. And I remember seeing him smoking pot every single day. So he was a, an addict in, in that form. And I know that that's controversial. And let me preface this by saying, these are only my opinions. Mm-hmm. I'm not a professional in any sense of the world, word, but this is my life story. And I'm just here to share that. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so that anyway, that was very um, that was my first experience. Um, with, that was very with, young with substance, right? That was very young. So that's really shapes a person in those early right. years. 
Right. I really feel like, um, you know, I finally got away from him when I was 18. My parents didn't know any of this, oh, you know. That situation too? Yeah, they didn't know any of it. They just, I, I was, I had the fear of God in me. I wasn't supposed to say anything, yeah. you know. And I was told, you know, oh, well, if you're a real woman, you'll do this line of cocaine or you'll do this, you'll smoke this yeah. pot or what have you. And, you know, you're very influenced at that age and 100%. I just felt like okay so I'll just do it all right because I want to be a woman I want to be what you want me to be mm -hmm. so I'm just going to do that you know I look back at it now and I'm like oh he was he was a pedophile he was um yeah he, an abuser in many ways a, a, an abuser you know like he took my virginity and he he exploited me in front of his friends and and things of that nature and I don't know I just have really bad memories and I think that that formed the way I looked at relationships from then on out you know um, I was very promiscuous after that I was very um, I didn't have a very good judge and character and a very good picker put it that way that is a lot and not to make it about me but and i wanted to really quickly say the reason i wanted so much to have layla on the podcast and i know i've touched on it in the in this season especially was that i have struggled with um addiction myself with drugs and with alcohol um and it was important it's important for me to share this i know we talked about it a bit here and there but it was important for me to share this with someone who has been the person that was living alongside the attic because I want your perspective. Mm -hmm. I want to know what it was like for my mom or my sister or the other people that had to watch me suffer that way. Um, so, and I, I want everyone to just experience that, that perspective as well. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to preface with that because it came to me when you were talking and I wanted to make sure I said that. Yeah. Um, but that was the same with my story was I was so young when it happened, when I was abused and I was 15 also, and took my virginity, all those things. The, it was actually very similar. He just wasn't that much older. He was only four years older. Mm -hmm. But uh, it definitely broke my picker. This is why yeah. I was saying that. It broke my picker, so I didn't mean to interrupt you. But No, I <laughs> love that. I yeah. love you sharing, too. I mean, this is a conversation. Yeah. This is us sharing our stories yeah. so that we can hopefully some something that we say resonates with someone out there and we if, if I help one person I'm good yeah you know absolutely. through, That's through how I always feel. you know so um, then I met uh, my first husband okay okay I was uh, a couple days out over um, 21 when I married him Wow and, yeah I know I know. Um, my dad asked me all the way down the aisle, are you sure, honey? Are you sure, honey? <laughs> and I, I'm like, I married his biceps, you know? Yeah. That, you know, that's what you just, you did. You yeah. know, I didn't, I don't know. There was no substance really there. But I, I um, out of that marriage, I got my beautiful son, Bo. And um, he's just been such an inspiration, um, such a heartache. Um, such a challenge but he is a miracle today I'll tell you yeah. that much um, but it, uh, so my husband at the time uh, after Bo was born three months after that he he left me and he didn't leave Bo's life but he left mine yeah um, so he's always kind of been in Bo's life uh, that's a good yeah. thing yeah 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 okay yeah I mean he was yeah very, very, you know, very much a part of my son's life, for sure. That's good. That side of the family has been a big influence on him. Okay. Um, so I was single for about eight years before I got married again. But during that eight years, I met um, my third addict. Uh, my first husband, I think... Maybe he was addicted to alcohol. I don't know. It's not my place to say, oh, he was an alcoholic or anything like that, because 
I drank right alongside him and you know so I, yeah. I don't know um, I, I do know that you know he cheated a lot and things of that nature so maybe he had some issues in regards to that but my uh, next boyfriend after that was a cocaine addict and um, hardcore you know and I thought oh you know what I can fix him. Mm -hmm. I can fix him. And that was my first experience with Al-Anon. So I go into Al-Anon and I think, oh, they're going to tell me exactly what I'm supposed to do to fix him. No. They tell you how to set healthy boundaries, protect yourself, and help yourself. Yeah. You know, and detach with love and all of this stuff. So that was my first experience with how to deal with an addict in a healthy manner but by that time I was so damaged and had a warped sense of really who I was what a relationship was and was just always um, I don't know I, I put up with a lot I had a lot of patience would you say that your and you can correct me if I'm wrong your self-worth was maybe damaged oh 100% and that a lot of that I imagine stem from the first relationship, right? Because that's where it came from. For mine, my self worth was, excuse me, for lack of better words, but it was shit yeah. for a long time, because I was so abused. My, my when I was fifteen and just put through the ringer, and it was just it really damaged me for a long, long time. Um, so yeah, yeah. I, I I didn't have. I don't know. I wasn't self aware enough to realize that at that time because I didn't realize that I was abused at that time. Yeah. I didn't realize I was raped, that that was statutory rape till I was well into my 40s in therapy and everything. And then I learned, oh, did you realize that statutory rape? I'm like, oh. And someone told you, is that how it works? Someone yeah. told you and then you were like, oh, oh. Exactly. That's what happened to me. Someone was like, Callie, you know that's rape. And I was like, no. What? Yeah. Uh, uh, what? And then I mm -hmm. was like, oh, yeah, okay. That makes way more sense than it was my fault and I was the one to blame because I either was too drunk or my skirt was too short or something along those lines. Right, it's always the girl's fault. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, but. Right? Yeah. So you're not self-aware enough to really realize that, um, that's what shaped you. Mm -hmm. That's why you're putting up with so much. I mean, I had the tolerance of, I mean, I would just keep going back for more, go, going back for more, you know? Um, yeah, I very abusive relationship, but, um, and he ended up graduating to heroin uh, one mm -hmm. day and, and passed away. I wasn't with him at that time. That was, you know, after we had split and stuff but okay. um, from that relationship I'm like okay the next guy because I was like almost 30 years old by that time I'm like the next guy I, I'm breaking the mold number one he's not gonna be Italian nothing against <laughs> Italians, but I am we a, were trouble I am an Italian magnet like if you're Italian I'm your girl or if you're an addict I'm your girl <laughs> you know no matter you know either one you know so I remember meeting my second husband I was working a second job when when I was a single mom I always worked a full-time office job and then had a part-time okay. bar job or waitress job something along those line so I worked at this um, bar and grill called the back nine in Broadview Heights Ohio no you did it Broadview yeah. Heights yeah that's Broadview. close to Cleveland yeah that's a suburb of Cleveland I was born in Cleveland yeah did we know this did yeah. I know that you were in oh, oh I was born and raised in Canton and then moved to Can Canal Fulton and Broadview Heights and blah 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 yeah yeah 50 years of my life Broadview in Ohio. Broadview Heights. I knew that it was Ohio, but I don't know that I knew that it was so close to Cleveland until you said Broadview Heights. Yeah, Broadview Heights. Because I know that name. Okay. Like, That's so crazy. Yeah, isn't that crazy? So we yeah. Wow. I know. We are connected on a lot of different I know. levels. Um, it was meant to be. I know. There are no accidents. So I crazy. I totally believe that. So he came in for Wings to Go one night, and he wasn't, I didn't feel like he was my cup of tea. 
you know? Mm -hmm. And then I only worked there a few nights a week and he came back, I guess, every single night looking for me because the owners told me my next shift, they're like, Layla, remember that guy that was here for Wings to go? Well, he's been in every night, so, and he walks again. And then he starts a conversation with me and he takes off his glasses and I'm like, oh. Mm. I'm like, nope, he looks Italian. And then he goes, do you like mussels? And I go, edible mussels? And he goes, yeah. And um, I said, I love mussels. And he goes, do you want to go to Whitey's for all you can eat mussels? I'm like, I would love that. <laughs> and from that day forward, we were inseparable. Yeah. I mean, there was just something that clicked with us. So I told him right up front, you know, this is, you know, my past and where I come from, and this is what I will not put up with. I will not tolerate drugs. I won't tolerate, you know, any of that. And he's like, oh, no worries about that. Yeah. You know, there's no worries. And um, here, I know all the signs and symptoms to look for for cocaine addicts and, you know, especially cocaine addicts. Yeah. So he started showing me those signs and I'm like, what is going on? How do I have back-to-back -back cocaine addicts in my life? What is wrong with me that I am picking these people and, and I'm like, oh my gosh, because I was so in love with him and then I found that out and I would even find it and I would approach him and say, here, I found it, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, long story short, I married him okay. when he was an addict, okay. okay? But a year into our marriage, and by the way, Bo was six years old and he was always fabulous with Bo when, when we first met and, and everything and, and throughout Bo's life, but, um, uh, when we when we got married and everything, I just remember, you know, he he wasn't really present because he was an addict. Yeah. During our vows and else. everything, yeah. you know, like I could tell. But I look, I just look back on it and I connect the dots. So a year into our marriage, it was getting really bad, and I just gave him an ultimatum. I go, you get help or I I have to leave. And I was so afraid because, oh my gosh, what am I going to tell my parents? Two divorces and oh, yeah. you know, so I was very tall. I tolerated a lot of stuff. And um, by the grace of God, he found sobriety Good. and he is sober to this day. Fantastic. And so most of our marriage, he worked a 12 step program and Bo was introduced to that very early on. Okay. I didn't drink a lot during um, our marriage of 21 years. We were together like 24 years, but um, you know, it wasn't a major thing for me, you know, to, yeah. to drink or anything like that. So we kept a pretty sober home and Bo, you know, that's how Bo grew up, at least in our home. And then in his dad's home, you know, that was, that was a different lifestyle over there. Um, but we always try to keep structure and rules and all of that stuff. So um, uh, then uh, Bo, as he grew up, he became um, a handful. He went, okay. he, he went to jail when he was only like 15, 16 over an incident and um, was in there for six months and it was really hard on us during that time, um, it was like breaking and entering. It was on, on the news and it was very um, life-changing yeah, for us, life-changing for us and life-changing for Bo. I really um, begged the judge, please, you know, don't incarcerate him. That's gonna change who he is. He's too young, Absolutely. you know, let's, let's yeah. figure out something else. Nope, incarcerated for oh, six months. Really? Yeah. And they put them as far as they could from us so that we would, it would be hard for us to go see him. And, yeah. But every weekend we would go see him. And it was just so painful, you know, having a kid incarcerated because you don't know exactly, oh my gosh, what are they going through? Um, are they feeding him well? Is no is, control. Right. Is he, you know, like he would say that he was witnessing really bad fights and all of this stuff. So that changed him. Absolutely. That changed who he was. 
So when he got out, he had missed some school and stuff, and I worked with the school system to figure out a way that he could graduate on time. So he went into this OWE um, course that was like half working, half school, and it just oh. kind of accelerated um, their way to graduate. Yeah. You know, gave yeah. him a different option. That's cool. So he graduated with his class, which was great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he wanted to go to the Marines afterwards. So we had a big going away party for him and every, everything. Um, made it through boot camp. So proud of him. Fantastic. Went to his graduation. Yeah. Um, he was just really, really, really vibrant and really, you know, into serving his country. Yeah. Um, he then went to, I think it's called the infantry, yep. I think is after boot camp. Okay. If he was an infantryman, which my cousin was an infantryman in the army. Okay. Um, so right. yeah, I guess I think that's the next okay. step if you go into infantry, right. the division of the military branch. So, okay. So from there, um, yeah, it, it didn't work out. He, no. he, he said, you know what? They lied and you know, they lied to me and, and said it was going to be something that it, it's not yeah. so he went a wall experience oh good he went a wall and he came home and we had to figure out how to get him back and um so we got him back and everything you know and, and of course they threw him into you know military jail I, what is that called um it's called something it's called something but i but can't anyway. think of it right now but yeah so they put him in and that and so uh, my husband and I at the time, my husband at the time, um, we paid an attorney to try to get him out, yeah. like $10,000. Oh, wow. Um, then the attorney wasn't returning our phone calls and stuff. And one day I, I just told my husband, I said, we're passing the airport. I go, drop me off. I'm going to go get my son. So he dropped me off at the airport with the clothes on my back. And I went to North Carolina yeah. to confront the attorney and get my son back. Long story short, two weeks later, I come back with my son oh. and find that he was dishonorably discharged because there was uh, marijuana in his system when he went back from being AWOL. So we would have never had to pay the $10,000 to get him out because he was going to be discharged, dishonorably discharged oh. anyway because of the drug use. Okay. So that was kind of like his gateway yeah. drug. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that was gateway drug. Um, How do you feel about that? Because I, I know, and if you don't want to talk about it, we don't have to, but I know there's a lot of controversy around that as if weed is a gateway drug or not. Mm. But I also think that alcohol is just as much of a gateway drug as we and I think that any substance is a gateway drug <clears throat> to another drug and I'm not saying that I am against weed I don't care what as long as you're not hurting me or my family or people I love yeah. I'm really like it's your life yeah do what you ha want to do with it but um yeah. I do recognize that if I probably had never started drinking I probably never would have tried coke Yes. And if I probably never smoked weed, I probably would have never started drink like all the things they just kind of like anyway, so I don't know what your perspective is on that on weed being a gateway drug or alcohol um, being gateway or well, I'm pretty opinionated because my background is in the medical field. I'm a medical coder, yeah, so there are what we call i c d ten codes, the international classification of disease, and they actually um have codes. That of disease for cannabis dependence and cannabis abuse. Yeah. So in the medical world, it is a drug. It is, you can be addicted to it. It's very real. Um, so that's my opinion. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be everybody else's exactly. opinion. Exactly. Yeah. Everybody can feel the way they want about it. I'm not here to say one way or the other. I just know what it is for me and what I've experienced it to be in my life, just being a witness to it. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? Um, I don't know if Bo would say, well, you're going to interview Bo anyway, but um, I don't know what Bo would say about his gateway drug. He might say alcohol, but I kind of, I don't know. It's either alcohol or marijuana. All I know is marijuana was in his bloodstream. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so 
he came he came back then and was trying to establish a life um, selling cars and stuff yeah. in Cleveland and uh, uh, was selling high-end cars to drug dealers you know oh, the, okay. you know yeah. at the dealership it was it wasn't like he was picking out drug dealers that's just who came that's just who came yeah. to buy these high-end cars so that from what I understand and I could be a little off on it but from what I understand that's when his opioid addiction um, started that's okay. when his you know he he kind of switched drugs okay. and uh, we didn't know a whole lot about this you know at this point he was um, I don't know, maybe 18, 19, something along those lines. Um, but he was, he was primarily living with us and he was living in our basement. Um, so on the side, he was, you know, doing illegal stuff yeah. on the computer in our basement, um, like selling um, a substance I won't talk about, okay. but through online and okay. shipping it and all that. And so we found out about that and we love him dearly. And it was a really hard decision for us, but we're like, you can't do illegal stuff in our home. And to draw be, boundaries. yeah, and we can't lose our livelihood over you, you know, yeah. so you got to stop that. And we gave him those boundaries and he crossed them and a lot of other things happened. So he moved out, moved to his dad's. A month in, he calls me and he goes, Mom, I'm moving to Hawaii with my buddy so-and-so from New Jersey. I'm like, are you crazy? That's oh, the most expensive place you yeah. can ever live. That's a jump. Yep, he was 19 years old and he was going to Hawaii. So he left, he went to Hawaii. Um, I told him, I go, you know, you know, the five, five, five deal. I think it's at Pizza Hut or whatever. I go, it's not going to be like that there. And he's like, that's the first thing he said to me. He called me, he goes, mom, that Pizza Hut, it's like 10, 10, 10. <laughs> that's you know? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so Bo becomes an addict. Yeah. Okay, so that becomes his lifestyle in Hawaii, and eventually he, he gets addicted to heroin, using it inter intravenously. Oh. Um, it wrecked us. I can't imagine. It, it, I mean, just all of, you know, the trials and tribulations that we went through with him as he was growing up, and then this, and half the time we didn't know if he was alive or dead. I had Honolulu, morgue, police, you name it, on speed dial on my phone. Yeah. Never slept with my phone off. Always on so ringer. Much on your nervous system. Oh yeah. Oh, very so much stress on your nervous very system. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. like just, um, uh, it was very, very, very stressful. Um, we would go back and forth to Hawaii. Um, and we didn't know how bad it was at first because he looked really healthy and he, he seemed to be successful and he was a mover and a shaker and doing all the sales, he can sell anything. Yeah. He was just brilliant, brilliant. Um, so for this to happen to my son, it can happen to anybody and it does not discriminate. So I joined, right, I joined, mm -hmm. yep, you? I was, I was addicted to heroin, but I was addicted to cocaine for yeah, many years. Yeah, many years, and no one would have ever guessed that. Yeah, no. until you saw me do it, and wow. it was just like, I, I mean, I did everything. I had a business. I had a house. I had, uh, I had a husband at one point. If I didn't have a husband, I was in a serious relationship, and I, it, it didn't develop until I was older, which is unfortunate. That I don't know. It's not unfortunate. It's just unfortunate in general, but. Um, yeah, you just, you would have never guessed the way I carry myself. I, in my opinion, you wouldn't have guessed. And other people have told me like, really? Callie? And, um, you were functional. I was super high functioning, super high functioning. Yeah. Um, that, it, but you know, I'm also bipolar and substance abuse is very high in amongst bipolar individuals. Um, it's a, it's high amongst a lot of people, mm -hmm. but especially mental illness, but, um, it just fueled, I was very high, I'm very high functioning bipolar and I'm very high functioning. Um, I was a very high functioning addict. 
I would drink a lot. I would do cocaine. I would stay up all night. I would get up and go to work the next day. I never slept. And I would just do it. And then I would go out again. And it wasn't every day, but it was a lot. It was too many days. It was right. definitely too many days. And it was a lot of, of, of it when I was doing it. Um, and it was scary. Like, I just remember being embarrassed of myself. I didn't even want, I remember the last time, sorry to get off track of your story, but no, no. I remember the last time I just went to my mom and I was crying and I was like, I couldn't get Annalise to school because I was too, I was still high and I just didn't feel comfortable driving. That's why I started crying. I was like, well, I don't want to do this anymore. And I called my best friend, Avonlea, and I was like, Avonlea, I don't want to be like this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be this person. And I never, I will not touch that stuff ever again because I don't ever want to be in that position again. That I was in that day where I can't take my kid to school. Right. Like I don't ever want to be that person. And I'm so sorry for anybody that has to go through it and for my mom to have to, I was in the back seat of the car. She was driving me to my house and I was like crying. She was calling me off of work. Um, and I was going to the hospital because I was suicidal because I just didn't, I was like, I can't live like this. I cannot live like this anymore on top of having a mental illness and then an addiction and poor Annalise saw me in that episode and it's just like I oh my god I just I'm so grateful for the person I am now mm -hmm. because I could have very easily been a very different person if I hadn't had if I had, had one ounce of a different morning that morning if I had, had any bit of a different morning I would be in a completely different life I wouldn't even be here right now yeah like definitely wouldn't be in Cape Coral but I wouldn't even be alive yeah. So, um, true. Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't discriminate. Is what it I was does getting not. At, not it doesn't discriminate. Yeah. You know, I found um, a group during that time, just a support group called uh, Families Anonymous. I don't know how they feel about me, you know, saying that, but anyway, it really helped me. Yeah. Um, and you sat around the table with doctors, lawyers, real estate agents, what, whomever. It does not discriminate. They all loved somebody that was a heroin addict. Most of it was heroin, such an epidemic, um, and such a beast to kick. It's usually the end, end of the story is death, yeah. you know, and the ones that are still living are miracles. And I would sit there and I know two, two people that lost their sons in pretty short distance of a time, and it, it was just heartbreaking. It almost made you like my first question when I walked in there. I go, so when is it that I stop burying my son every day? Because oh. I bury him every day. Um, the the pain that it causes on on the loved one is incredible. Um, that you're so helpless because you're mourning somebody who's who is alive yes. and walking around and you may not know if they're alive or dead but they are they're not in the ground that's more settling to me because you know where they're at yeah and I, I know that that's morbid but that's more settling to me i know my mom feared every time i dropped in lisa at her house to go out I know my mom trying to get me to not go out all the time. And I didn't go out all the time. I didn't go out that much, but I went out too much. But I know she feared every single time yeah. that she was not going to see me again. Like, I yeah. know I know it. Because the way she would look at me, I love you, Callie. Love you so much. Be good. Don't do anything stupid. And, like, she just knew what I was doing. Yeah. And it's just, I feel so bad. I put her through that pain. And my dad through that pain, like, Sorry, now I wouldn't be like crying, but I just feel so bad that I did that to my parents and my kid. Oh God. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, I I understand that you're burying your child because I can imagine that's what my mom was going through every time I left the house to yeah. go out and get drunk. And yeah. She couldn't stop me. She, I was gonna. She knew I was gonna get it one way or another, whether she was babysitting Annalise or I had a babysitter babysitter. So she may as well be the babysitter because she can at least control that right and protect that right so um yeah i get it yeah. i get it i you know if it makes you feel any better i was a really young mom and i didn't make the best decisions and i was reeling from being left at the three month old so i didn't always make the best decisions and i wasn't always pure as the driven snow either you know mm -hmm. um 
I look back and yeah, I'm like, I could have been a better mom, but I, I did the best I knew at 23 years of age, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. I was older, I was 27 when I had Annalise, but her dad, that's what you were talking, I was like, God, her story's really torn. Her dad left after two weeks oh, wow. of her being born, on, on, along with on and off throughout our entire relationship. But two weeks in, I just looked at him and I said, do you even love me? And he said, he didn't know. I was like, then you should probably leave because I don't want to raise a child in a loveless relationship. I don't want to be just with your with her dad because it's what you're supposed to do. Right. And he was like, okay, I'll leave. And I was like, okay. And then he, he left and I raised her alone for the first year. My parents were gone and it was just me and her and I did everything I could. I it was I had a cleaning business at the time. And I was doing my personal training on the side and I just took her with me. I didn't want to take her to daycare yet. I just took her with me and I carried her on me as I cleaned and things. Oh my God. And yeah, so. I wasn't young, but I was I was alone because my parents were traveling. They came back in the summers, but um, yeah, I definitely did the best I could with what I had. Yeah, I think at the time, all of our parents, you know, our parents, parents did, did the best yeah. they could too. Um, you know, with the tools that they had. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so um, so that support group really helped me though. It it, yeah. it was um, I went every week. And I just had a lot of friends in that group that, you know, we just all had the same heartache, you know, the yeah. same story. Um, some of ours ended differently, but um, yeah. My friend, Mark, um, he was my real estate agent, my friend, and I, I met him through that. And he even told me, he texted me because I was posting about Bo and he's like, God, such a miracle. He goes, I just wish my son was here so he could see that. And he goes, feel free to share my story. I go, Mark, that's your story to tell. You could tell it the best, but yeah, yeah, I just, yeah, some, some people make it, some people don't. But, it is a um, miracle. It, yeah, really, really. So um, back and forth, you know, to Hawaii, uh, the last time, um, was uh, he uh, the hospital called and said that you know we have your son he is in our psych unit he could really use some family so what I did before I went I was very conscientious of not enabling because I think that you learn as you go when you're dealing with addicts what to do what not to do you kind of live and learn and, um, you know, my, my husband at the time, Steve, um, he, he never knew what it was be like to be on this side of addiction, you know, like the loved one, you know, yeah. and stuff. And it really, really affected him. But he always had really good advice and really good decision making and stuff like that. But he didn't want me to go to Hawaii and for some reason. Um, he thought it would be enabling. Yeah. Um, I didn't look at it like that because I'm the mom. I'm being called by the hospital. Hey, yeah. you know, your son could use family. So I did see a therapist that specialized in addiction before I left um, so that I could be guided. Okay, what to do, what not to do. Okay, so don't put him in your hotel room. Don't put him in your car. Keep him in the facility, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I went um, and uh, he was transferred out of the psych unit into a rehab facility and when they he got to rehab he was detoxing off of um heroin really really bad so they called me and they said you have to come get your son take him to the emergency room i was very floored i'm like i thought don't you guys take him to the emergency room no so yeah, i took him. They didn't just take i him. took him yeah Okay. I took him to the emergency room and um, he wanted what he wanted. He, he wanted Suboxone and there, there was not a doctor that was allowed, was permitted to prescribe Suboxone in the emergency room that night. Okay. So he was like freaking out, wanted to leave. And I'm like, if he leaves, he's going to kill himself. He's going to kill himself. I'm screaming, I'm crying, I'm begging the doctors that see this all the time and become very callous to it. Mm -hmm. and they really don't understand a lot about addiction in my opinion, especially if they've never had it personally, like yeah. their son, their daughter, their whatever, you know? So I remember so clearly this 
doctor standing in front of these double doors that Bo was heading heading towards, and um, he looked like Jesus Christ. And I'm like, please help us, please help us, don't let him leave. And he just stood there in front of the door and he goes, how can I help you, son? And he sat with my son and he reasoned with him. And it really helped because I was able to take him back to the rehab, you know? And so long story short, that rehab didn't work. And he went through years and years of more struggle. And um, one day, um, one of his friends saw him in a park shooting up and he was a skeleton. He looked nothing like my strong boy that I love and I gave birth to. He looked like a skeleton of himself. And his friend took him, scooped him up, and took him to the emergency room. And I don't know what was different that day. Bo will have to tell you that. Yeah. But, um, Something happened that he just knew if he used again, he was gonna die. So something clicked, it was a miracle. And it's now a miracle. and now he's healthy, telling his story, helping other people um, stay sober, works a 12-step program, has such a structured life, uh, beautiful family, has given me a couple of grandchildren, and I'm just amazed with him in a story. So it just goes to show that everything happens for a reason. Absolutely. And I'll tell you something. Um, Throughout the years, um, I've used alcohol as a coping. You know, like Stephen and I got divorced. Like actually when I came home from that trip to Hawaii, I I had learned that, you know, there had been some things that went on and, and broke up our marriage anyway. Um, so I was not only dealing with a divorce, but I was dealing with a heroin addict as a son. And, you yeah. know, I went through a lot during that time. But um, uh, when I got divorced, I started drinking all the time. Because when I was married, I hardly ever drank. So I used it as a coping mechanism. So it's acceptable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's not looked at as a drug, but there is an ICD-10 code for the dependents and the abuse, (laughs) and there are lots of repercussions about it. But um, so that's what I started to do. And then my dad um, drowned in front of me in 2020 um, at his favorite place on my mom's birthday, Nokomis. Um, And I tried to save him and it didn't work. And I, I just... I really struggled with that for a long time. After that, I drank every day, every day. And I go, one day I said to myself, you know what, look at Bo, look at, look at the gift that you were given. Yeah. Look at him. So I just said to myself, it's time to feel it and heal it. Quit yeah. trying to make it go away through alcohol. Feel it and heal it, right? It's so easy to numb. So much easier to numb. That's the thing. Yes. When I got sober, I was like, I have to feel everything now. Yeah, it hurts sucks. so bad. Mm-hmm. It hurts so bad. Mm-hmm. But it goes away and it gets easier. Yeah. And the hurt doesn't hurt. And the good feelings feel so much better. Oh yeah. The good feelings and the gratitude that you feel feels so much more than any high or drunk I ever felt in my life. Yep. than any numbing ever felt. The good I feel now feels a million times better than anything I ever felt before when I was drinking and doing drugs. 100% agree, 100% yeah. agree. You can really accomplish your goals better, you're clearer, at least for me. I don't feel like I was ever physically addicted to it. I really feel like I just had a really bad relationship with it and I used it as a coping mechanism yeah. because it's not a problem for me to just let it go, you know? Um, And through watching my son get sober and work a program, he has inspired me to just live a sober life. And it's so much richer. And now, you know, I'm inspired by boho living, you know, like the the brand of it um, is gonna be more than just an online store. I really look forward to once I start making money, taking some of the proceeds, develop a foundation that bridges the gap between detox 
and rehab because that's where Bo would always fall through the cracks. Okay, yeah. so we're discharging you now from detox, but there's no rooms available unless you have 25 grand and you can go to the swanky one. Well, we never had that. So it was like, okay, so what, what are they supposed to do during that time? And he would go out on the streets again and start using. So I'd love to bridge that gap, um, make boho living kind of a community, a lifestyle do podcasts with yes. you, you know, and thank you so much for being my business coach and, oh my God, and guiding me. Thank you for trusting me. Uh, absolutely. I, I trust you. It doesn't I, work. I'm going to, yeah, <laughs> right. five of these were your sneeze. No. <laughs> um, I literally left, leave every, the times we meet. I'm like, I love doing this so much. Like I love working with you. So it's yeah. so much fun. It's so much fun because you're so passionate and excited about it. Thank you. And that just makes it so much more fun for me. And it makes it so much easier. I always tell people this on social media, especially when I'm sharing my stories. If it's something you love and you're excited about, it's so much easier to share. Yeah. And in turn, it's so much easier to make money because you have to share what you do yeah. in order to make money. And not that it's all about money or anything like that, but obviously we need it to, to live. Yeah. Um, and you want to be successful. It's so much easier to become a success and impact lives in a really positive way and impact your own life in a really positive way and your family's life when you're just excited about it and you're so excited about it and it makes me so excited about it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and it's funny you say that with the, not really funny, but I had no idea until you told me when we were talking about your vision that there is an in between between detox and rehab. Yeah, it has no to be clue. like a room open, like at a yeah. sober living or a rehab. And a lot of times, oh, well, we have to wait because there's nothing available right now. But you have to, we have to discharge you because you're at your limit. Yeah, that's crazy. I know, isn't it? Yeah, so if that's the goal eventually, yeah, hopefully sooner than later, is to open this foundation yeah. so you can provide that for addicts that are in the middle stages, which is yeah. beautiful to have that along with the, the lifestyle of, what did we say it was? It's thriving, basically, so for people that I can't remember exactly what we were saying, but the, a lifestyle of, I have both my notes. I have my notes right here, which is hysterical. Oh, oh, you cheetah. Um, I can't remember what it is exactly, but. Um, well, I know our oh, tagline like, is reveal your soul. Yeah, so, yeah. so um, anyway, we were just talking about like surviving li life and thriving and life instead yeah. of just ex existing. existing and being in, either an addict or homeless or things like that yeah. or whatever, struggling in any way. So surviving instead of struggle, that's what it was, surviving instead of struggling. Yeah. Um, or thriving. I even like to go further than surviving and thriving instead of struggling. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so yeah. it's going to be a, a literally a, a lifestyle brand. Yeah. It's going to encompass everything about living this. And it's, it's so beautiful because it's not just boho. It's your son's name. Yep, B E A U. Yes. Hyphen Ho. Yes. So it's a play on the boho. Yes. And I love bohemian clothing and decor, and that's my passion. And you know what? It's taken me a long time to really say, okay, do what you're passionate about. Quit sitting and doing stuff just because you know it. Do what you're passionate. I'm going to be 60 this year. It's time. It is time. And. I Start with the decor, start with the women's fashion, bohemian women's fashion and decor, and eventually I look to get men's clothing and children's clothing, and I have a vision of potentially having brick and mortar. My vision is to be in the lobby of a swanky hotel mm -hmm. or a hotel chain, um, but we need that in order to have the proceeds so that we can start a foundation. Yeah. I don't necessarily know that it's gonna be a brick and mortar foundation that houses addicts, but I wanna develop relationships with rehabs and sober living facilities for people that can't afford those facilities and help help bridge that gap and, and help get them better and save lives. Yes, absolutely. Um, and yeah, so she was sharing her vision. We have like, she has so many visions, and I'm very lucky to be able to share in those visions with you. Thank you so and much. Grateful that you allow me the honor of sharing those visions with you. I couldn't do it without you, Callie. Oh, thank you. That's so sweet. I'm gonna cry again. <laughs> really? No, I couldn't. I really, do, I couldn't that. do it without you. Like when I moved back to um, Florida, I, I did move to Hawaii for a short stint. Um, 
because I have beautiful grandchildren I wanted to watch them grow. It just didn't work out. But anyway, you were like the one of the first people that I I met. I mean, I know a lot of people in Fort Myers, yeah. but we met almost right away when I came back. And there's a reason for that. Yeah. And you have my dad's birthday. So. And you know what? Signed, sealed, and delivered, baby. When I heard that, yeah. you were in. Yeah. That was like that my was dad saying, honey, this is it do it this is your final sign that you need to do this for yourself yep. and for all the people you're going to help along the way yep um yeah that was beautiful when we found that out i was like what really yeah. what we're both august babies yes the best month of the year absolutely um yeah so i is there so usually at the end what i ask to make sure i didn't ask a lot because you have such a story that I didn't have to ask a lot. Oh, um, Lord. <laughs> no, it's beautiful. It's okay. a beautiful story. Thank you. Um, but is there anything, I know I didn't, I'm saying that because I know that I didn't ask a lot, but is there anything that I didn't ask you that you wish I would have asked you or should have asked you? No. I, I, no. Okay. I just talk a lot. Sorry. No, it's, <laughs> don't, don't be sorry. It's, it's a beautiful story, and I could have asked, but I didn't want to interrupt because you were, everything that I wanted to maybe potentially ask, you were answering as you went. Oh. Like you were just going in perfect order of what I would have asked or guided you. Not like I guide anybody on these things, but you know what I mean. It's keep the heart. conversation going, yeah. You were literally just speaking from the heart, and that's all I ever ad admire or in a person and wish for this podcast. So Right. I was talking to my son before, before this because I was nervous, you know. I talked to my mom, and she's kind of old school, you know, like, are you really going to give your real name? Are you going to really, you know... You're really going to say a lot, you know, like, be careful what you say. I don't want to be edited like that anymore. I feel like I can't help anybody if I keep my secrets and my story to myself because everything that happened to me, everything that happens to us, happens for a reason. We're here for a reason. Find your pain and make it your passion. Yeah. That's, that's the best advice I can give you. I talked to my son. He's like, just tell the truth. I talked to my good friend Craig. He's like, I support you. Tell the truth. So I got that from a lot of people, and that was the main message. Just tell the truth, and that's what I did today. And you told your truth. Exactly. Yeah. I didn't tell you nearly everything, if you can believe it, but that's the you know abbreviated version. We appreciate you for sharing all that you did share with us. <laughs> Very Thanks, much appreciated. Kelly. And I love your honesty and your passion and your truth. Um, and that it came from your heart. Thanks, Kelly. So um, we will uh, share, well, just stay tuned because we're gonna share where you can find Boho Living very soon um, in the coming months and things like that. But definitely stay tuned and just check along with the story and the, and the journey. Um, I'm gonna be interviewing her son, Bo, yes. in the coming, hopefully soon, um, that we can figure it out because he's in Hawaii and I'm in Florida, but we'll figure it out soon. Um, but yeah, uh, do you have anything else that you want to share today? No, just thank you so much for, I feel 20 pounds lighter. Oh, wonderful. You know, it's you been very that. cathartic. Who needs a therapist? So just right. just do a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> tell yeah. the world your, your story, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. It's very, it's very healing. Good. I'm happy. That's why it's called Healing Hold the Podcast. There you go. Um, so, Layla, thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you all for joining us for another episode of Healing Hold the Podcast. We will check you out next time.